Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. My name is Bree Noble. I am so happy to be here today with Tanya Lawson. We're going to talk about ways to expand income for musicians, my favorite subject, and some little known and not often tapped into ways to do this that involve the internet. So before we dive into that, I want to have Tanya tell a little bit about her story, um, her background as a musician, and how she kind of stumbled into this area of SEO and like expanding musicians' income streams while also um, working as a musician. I'm so excited to be here. So, well, I got started when I finished graduate school. I did my bachelor's in music education. I did my master's and doctorate in clarinet performance. And when I finished graduate school, I applied for 50 university positions. That's a lot. Wow. That that was a lot. Yes. I needed a job. So I um I made the short list. I made the, the final two in two positions, took interviews, and in both cases they hired someone with more more experience, which you know that's that's pretty obvious, fresh out of graduate school. So I was like, well, what do I do now? So I started building a private music studio. And um the next year, there were only two positions in the entire United States available. So I applied for both of them. Once again, I made it to the final two and um, they picked the better fit. It was at an HBCU. And um, I was like, well, I'm just going to keep working on my music studio. And that went really well for me. You know, I did a little gigging. I was teaching lessons full time, which I still do. And I absolutely love it. It had, I've fallen in love with teaching, but there, the the area I am in, in the Nashville area, we are actually allowed to go into the schools to teach music lessons. We pull students out of band class. I'm a clarinetist for part of band class and teach lessons right there in the schools during the school day. It makes it very convenient for parents. And to my knowledge, Tennessee and Texas are the only two states that do this. I may be wrong. I've I have never heard of that. That is so cool. I wish we had that in California. I've only taught in Tennessee and Texas, so (laughs) I'm familiar with it. But they had this this moment where they thought about ending that program. And I freaked out because I had built a full studio. And what would I do if they got rid of lessons in the schools? Would all of these students still take? So I was like, I don't need to keep all of my eggs in one basket. I need additional income streams. So I got to looking into blogging. It was really popular at the time. I started a blog. It wasn't really doing anything. I then took a course on search engine optimization and I learned a little bit and realized my blog wasn't really going to ever make money the way it was designed. So I actually started a coffee website, a niche website to learn from. And that coffee website still makes me money today. And then the pandemic hit and everything just ran amok. Well, the good news is I had already been familiar with technology and everything. Transitioning my studio online was not a big deal. I really kept most of my students. So I was one of the lucky ones, but I had extra time because I'm working from home all the time. So what did I do? I started another website. So now I have a total of three websites. I have my personal website, tanyalawson.com, which is my business website. I have a coffee website, and then I have a gardening website now that is starting to bring in just a little bit of money. It's still a pretty new website. And I have these passive income streams now. And um, I know you're big on multiple income streams because we really don't need to keep 
our eggs in one basket. And multiple income streams are great, but if you can make some of them passive, as in you do the work one time and they continue to make you money, that's even better. Yeah, no, absolutely. So let's break this down. Like how does your coffee website make money? Okay, so my coffee website, actually all all three of my websites make money this way. Um, I use affiliate marketing. So I am an Amazon affiliate. I'm a share a sell affiliate. And then I'm also affiliates with some private companies. Um, I'm a Beanbox affiliate. If you've heard of Beanbox, the coffee subscription. And when people search Google and they might be looking for how to brew pour over coffee and they come across an article on my website. So that's a blog post. And it has affiliate links in there. So I'm talking in this article about how to brew pour over coffee. And I might mention that a Chemex brewer is a great tool to use. And I just highlight Chemex brewer and put a little Amazon link in there. When they click that link, if they go to Amazon, anything they purchase within the next 24 hours, I get a commission off of. It might be that brewer. It might be new camping backpacks, it might be dishwasher tabs, whatever, I get a commission off of it. I also have ad revenue on there. I I am set up with an ad company and they put ads on my website and I make money every time somebody just goes to my website. Yeah, that's some great incentive to get traffic to your website, right? So I'm assuming the traffic comes from you creating valuable articles. Now, do you promote these articles in any way organically? Do you pay for ads to the articles? I do not. They are all set up. They are all optimized to get found on Google through SEO, search engine optimization. And how hard is it to learn search engine optimization? Like, is it, is it really complicated? What are the important things to know to kind of make an article show up higher on Google? Well, one, it's not complicated at all to learn what you need to do. Um, I have a free get found on Google SEO cheat sheet um, just on my Instagram. Anybody can go and download and that will get you started. The thing with search engine optimization is that Google is always changing. Mm -hmm. They're They're constantly changing what they want and what they think is good. So if you set up your website and everything for SEO a year ago, it might be getting found on Google and it might not. If you set it up three years ago, all of those are old practices and they're no longer relevant. So Google has changed quite a bit and they just caused a bunch of uproar in the SEO community with their new helpful content update. And really the best way to describe this update is actually unhelpful content. It doesn't It doesn't identify helpful content, but what it does do is it identifies content that is not helpful and it takes it out of the rankings. So this has actually helped me a lot. I have have one article on how to pick the best clarinet mouthpiece. I wrote it three, four years ago now, and it's always hovered in positions one through five on Google. But over the last year ago or so, it's been in the four or five position instead of the top three. And sales, I was still making sales from it, but not as many. And then with this helpful content update, I all of a sudden noticed on my Amazon, everybody was buying clarinet mouthpieces. All of these clarinet mouthpiece sales. And I went to look at it because I'd really forgotten about it. My website is going more business now instead of clarinet. And all of a sudden I'm ranking number one for that. And that's because I have authority when it comes to clarinet websites, whereas some of these other websites that we're ranking, even though they had good SEO, they'd never probably seen a clarinet. So it really, this new update has helped us creatives in general, musicians, especially who we are experts. We are the authorities. And as long as we're creating great content, Google is going to put it up there. And what signifies to Google that you have, quote, authority? Because I know there's also kind of like an authority score for a website. And there's all like also plays in how old your website is. So what are all those kind of things that Google's looking at? 
Okay, well, you're talking about two different things right now. Okay. So the authority score that you're talking about, the domain authority, that is not a metric by Google. That is actually a metric developed by Moz. And you can look at it because it does guess pretty accurately how well you're going to rank on Google. They call that your DA. Um, the authority with Google, Google has something they call EAT. It used to be E-A-T, but now they've added an extra E. It's E-E-A-T. So that stands for expertise, experience, authority, and trustworthiness. So Google, when they go crawl your website, so you put, maybe you post a new blog post and Google goes through and crawls it. Well, they're looking at that blog post. They're also going to follow any links in that blog post and see where they go. So if I just wrote an article on, you know, the Google helpful content update, for example, and I put a link in there to the Google's best practices, they're going to follow that and go, oh, she's quoting us. We're okay. Or if you wrote an article on um, how to teach piano lessons to beginners, and that article links to the best piano books for beginners. And that links to something else. It's creating a chain of links that Google can follow that says, oh, wait, this, this person knows what they're doing. You can also add in your personal information, your bio, any backlinks that are coming into your website. So if other websites are linking to your website, that boosts your authority as well. And all of these factors combine, let Google know you know what you're talking about. Mm. So for example, let's get a little meta, like I create a blog post based upon our conversation here, and then I link to your website, and then maybe you link to that article from your website. This is creating like a, a web that tells Google that this is something worth linking to, right? Not quite. Very close. Okay. Though. okay. So you, you create a blog post and you link to my website. That's good. That's what we call a white hat backlink. If I then in turn link right back to that article on your website, that's not good because mm. that looks like we paid each other for a link exchange. However, if I then wrote something else, a different article that linked back to your website, that would be different. Got it. So there's a lot of rules that go into it and it can be really confusing. When I was first learning SEO, I guess, first of all, let me just say, there aren't a lot of females out there teaching SEO. It's predominantly a male dominated world. It is also predominantly techie bros that are mm -hmm. teaching SEO. And honestly, that's where I learned SEO from. But then none of that applied to musicians. It was all about niche websites. That's why I started with a coffee website because I didn't see any way I could make that work on my website. But as I learned more, I learned how to do certain tweaks to make it work in the creative space as well in a way that these techie bros can't do because they're not musicians. They're not creatives. They are very analytical. And I've made it work for creatives. So do you actually teach musicians how to apply this to their own website? Yes. Yes, I do. I um, I have a membership called Creative SEO that um, I have some great musicians in and they're working with it. I keep them up to date every time there's a Google update. When this helpful content update first dropped, a lot of pages got de-indexed, which means they can't be found on Google. So I instantly just popped a bonus video into my membership telling them how to to check it and um it's they get a new master class every month on a relevant seo topic i try to stay on top of the trends for them so they don't have to to read through all the tweets and all the techie mumbo jumbo that's kind of hard to understand at first yeah i, I think most musicians would really appreciate that like even for myself, I'm like, hmm, that sounds very useful. I think I could use that because it does. It feels overwhelming. It sounds simple. It sounds like a great thing to add to what you're already doing. But then you're like, yeah, but I got to do it just right or it's not going to work. Yeah. And the good news is once you kind of get in the system of doing things, it becomes much easier. You learn exactly. You can do it so quickly. Mm. It takes no time at all. 
And um, when people first come into creative SEO, if they already have like 50 blog posts on their website, I'm like, just forget about those 50. Start all your new ones here. Mm -hmm. You can then go back later on little by little and edit those 50, but start right now doing it the right way. And if they don't have any blog post on their website, that's great. They can start from square one, knowing exactly how to do it. And how, like, cause maybe musicians are thinking that sounds cool, but like, I don't, I'm not a writer. Like how much am I going to have to write? How often am I going to have to write? Okay. So I totally get that. Um, some people really love to write and prefer blogs because they're a better writer than the speaker. Other people are like, ah, I don't want to do a blog. I have to write. I'm not good at it. I was never good at it. And here's the thing. Blog posts don't need to be academic. As a matter of fact, they shouldn't be academic. When I write a blog post, I pretend that I am just like, we're talking right now. I'm explaining to you how something works. And that's going to rank higher, actually, than academic language. Mm. Secondly, I am a huge prof- proponent of AI. And I know in the music community, everybody's like, no, not AI, stay away. You know, it's, they're going to be writing music. Okay, AI can be used for good or it can be used for evil. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and here's my opinion on it. I use AI writers to come up with a first draft for me. It helps me crank out content quickly. So I literally, I I have a paid AI service that I use because it's a little bit better, but you can even do this with a free version of chat GPT. If you know how to, if you know how to use it properly, which I have a whole class on that in my membership too. But um, with AI writing, I cranked out six new blog posts in a matter of an hour. Now, those are not blog posts that I'm instantly going to publish. I am going to go read through that writing. I change the language. I sometimes change facts. Mm. You are the expert. You're using the AI writer kind of as an assistant to give you a first draft. And then you go in and you make it in your own language. You explain things further if you think they need to be explained. You say, you know, that's repetitive. We're just going to cut that out, just like you would have a first draft of a paper. And you really make it your own. And it can make the writing process a lot easier. It can also make make the writing process a lot faster. In an ideal world, you would be getting one blog post a week out. However, we don't always have time for that. But as long as you're getting one a month out, it shows Google that you're consistently adding content, which means you're not a dead website. Now, if you don't post to it in like three years, you're going to go down in the ranking, but it does not have to be every week at the same time. It's not like it used to be. Mm. Yeah. It's good to know that makes it a lot less daunting to think about starting something like this. And so with musicians, I feel like, like the, the obvious thing is, okay, I'm a, a teacher of music I can write a lot about, you know, the instrument technique, blah, 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 you know? So what if you're not, what if you're an artist and you, you know, you're putting out music, what kinds of things could you write blog posts about that could attract people and get them to click on your affiliate links? Oh, there are tons of things. So one, if you're an artist and you're putting out music, affiliate rates are links are great, but you need to be linking to your own stuff. You Mm. want them buying directly from you. Um, I mean, that's even better, right? So maybe write what inspired me to write this or what was the inspiration behind this? Or maybe you're a songwriter, you know, five things to do when you're stuck and you have writer's block. Little things like that. And then that opens the door for them to purchase your music or for them to hire you down the road. Or, you know, if you're that songwriter, maybe you create a digital download like a writer's block workbook, the songwriter's block workbook. And then you sell that at a very low cost on your website. Well, once that's created and you've written this article about it and people find this article, then they click through and buy your product. That's passive income. Mm. You did the work one time and you're continuing to make money off of it. 
Yeah, that's awesome. And I mean, obviously I do that in my own business, but I find that musicians sometimes have a hard time thinking outside of the box of how they can do something like that if they're not necessarily a teacher or, you know, have courses to sell. Oh, no, I understand that completely. And, you know, courses are are great. I have them. I actually have three courses. Um, I have an SEO course. I have a studio building course and I have a passive income course. But even in my passive income come course. Yes, there is a way to teach courses. There's a way to talk about affiliate marketing, how to make money that way. Um, there's a way to talk about how to make money off of ad revenue, how to make money off of digital downloads, something as simple as that. Yeah. Yeah. Th- those are all some really good ideas. So what is the role of social media in this? Are you promoting these blog posts on social media and are you building a a base on your social media as well? Or are you focused mostly just on the website and Google? I am focused mostly on the website and Google. Now I have social media and I do a lot of promotion for my courses and my membership on social media. Um, And I... I'm very business minded and I have very specific streams. So on my TikTok, that's more about building a music studio Mm. on my Instagram. That's all about improving your website, getting found on Google, but the websites themselves, the only purpose that I think of with them is to get found on Google, to get an organic traffic. People who find you on Google, That's organic traffic. They find you when they do a Google search. That is our holy grail. Because think about it. If you're actively searching for something on Google, you have a problem and you need a solution to it. Or you're you're looking to buy something. Okay? Well, if they find you, they're already in that buy mindset. They are warm. They are ready to go. And if you can provide them with what they need, they are there for it. Whereas on social media, you have to spend time convincing people that they need it. The people who find you on Google, they know they need it. They're there and they're ready to buy it. Yeah, that's very true. And, you know, it's it's so much easier just to scroll on by on social media. You have to work so hard to get their attention to even stop. Whereas on Google, they type something in, right? There's serious intent there. Yes. And social media is great. It's a wonderful short-term driver. And when I'm teaching you about blogging in the beginning, I encourage you to share your post on social media because it will get you traffic faster. But our goal is for organic traffic to start taking over. And it takes a good year before Google really starts to trust you and really starts to put your stuff out there. But over time, you rely less and less on social media. And it's a great long-term strategy because we don't have time to be on Instagram 24-7. Yep. Yep. I mean, I really think of organic traffic like like a tree, right? And that it takes a while to like take root and start growing. And, and lots of people are like, but that's going to take too long. Well, yes, just like a tree, but like once it starts growing, it starts growing on all kinds of different directions, right? And and really gets big fast. So, you know, you put the, the work in now and then you've got this, this thing working in the background for you. Absolutely. So what about Google ads? What is your opinion about that? I have not spent any time messing with Google ads. Because I don't need to. Mm -hmm. I have traffic coming in anyway. Um, What I have heard about Google ads, I cannot give you firsthand experience because I've not used them. They are expensive. Yep. And you really need to hire an ad specialist if you want them to be effective. And then that also is expensive. Mm -hmm. And most musicians don't have that kind of money to drop. Google ads are for big corporations. And that's my personal opinion from an outside view of someone who's not used them. I agree. I mean, I have not, I have looked into Google ads. I've educated myself a little bit, but I haven't taken the plunge just because I know that they are expensive and they're great because someone who's there has serious intent, but the cost to get them is so much more. I could probably get 10 leads from Facebook ads for the same price as one lead from Google. Exactly. And then, you know, you better have a really good conversion rate if you're paying that much. 
Absolutely. But honestly, I think that ranking on Google is going to get you more traffic faster because I'll just speak for myself personally. When I go to do a Google search, the first four are always sponsored and it says sponsored. And I know that. So my brain instantly goes, okay, what is the first ranked one that's not sponsored? That person knows what they're talking about. Me too. And also it's going to be more relevant because people can choose to place ads for whatever keywords they want. So exactly. they can place an ad for, you know, something about flutes on things about clarinets because they know, oh, it's wind instruments. You know, people might be interested in both, but that's not going to be relevant to you if you're looking about clarinet mouthpieces and they're talking about flutes. Exactly. That makes sense. Now, I know that you also talk about ways to increase the income you already get from your studio by adding affiliate options. How do you do that? Yes. Okay. So if you have never, have you ever used Sheet Music Plus? Yes. They have an excellent affiliate program. Mm. If you are on their bottom tier, which I am, which most people are, it means you're making, I think, less than 10,000 in sales. And I'm sorry, my studio didn't buy that much in music. Um, <laughs> That's a lot of music. Get, you get 8% commission. Mm. Now, to compare, Amazon might offer you 1%. So Sheet Music Plus also doesn't have all of the rules that Amazon Affiliate has. So their terms of service are a lot more lax. So I use Sheet Music Plus links as an affiliate just to recommend music to my students. And I have like a whole set of my affiliate links for all of the music books that I use on a regular basis. Mm. And then what I do is when I recommend a book to a student, I just go and I grab that link and I pop it into a text message and text it to the student or their parent. They buy through that link. I get an 8% commission off of that sale. Yeah. And you could even have like recommended, you know, uh, like one, one page site, almost like a, like a link tree or something that was like all the recommended music that you had. And each one of them is an affiliate link and that you could just easily send that to any student. Right. Exactly. Or yeah, exactly. Now you can't do that with Amazon that goes against Amazon's terms of service, but you can with sheet music plus, but the way I get around that with Amazon for example, when I wrote that article on the next on the best clarinet mouthpiece, the reason I wrote it was because the articles that were ranking at number one were recommending mouthpieces that were literally cheaper and worse than the ones that come with clarinets. <laughs> and all my clarinet players out there are going to instantly know what I'm talking about. OK, I'm not going to name brands because we're not going to have any libel situation on here, but they were terrible and they're ranking number one. So I was like, oh, I can instantly outrank these people. So I wrote this article and three days later, I was number one. Now, some other good writers who know SEO got in there too. And that's when I dropped down to five, I'm back to one again. But what I do is when I need a student to get a new mouthpiece, they need to upgrade. Parents always have questions. So I thought of every question a parent has ever asked me about it, and I put it into this blog post. So all I do now is I text the student or the parent a link to that blog post mm. and said, I want this student to get this mouthpiece. Here is a blog post I wrote, or here is an article I wrote explaining it all. And it answers their questions. They buy the mouthpiece. Often they'll get new reads and a ligature as well. So it brings in a fair amount of commission. And this isn't like, you know, being sneaky or weird or anything, I'm having students buy what I need them to buy to be successful in the first place. And I'm getting a commission off of it and it's not costing them anything more. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I do plenty of that kind of thing in my business as well. It's stuff that you would recommend anyway. Mm -hmm. And why shouldn't you, because you are connecting these people to this brand, why shouldn't you get a commission off of it? It seems completely fair to me. What what are the um, restrictions with Amazon? I know that one thing is you have to make a certain amount or make sales within a certain amount of time or they shut your account down, right? Yes. So Amazon has two different affiliate programs. They have their Amazon Associates program, which is designed for bloggers and people with websites. And then they have their Amazon Influencer program. And that one is designed for social media. And you have to have... I've never qualified for that program. Um, 
I tried after my Instagram following got above a thousand and no, I mean, you've got to have a huge audience to qualify for that program. Mm -hmm. Now that one, you can put links in your blog post or not in your, in your social media post in Instagram, that sort of thing. You can have, uh, you can build an Amazon influencer storefront on their website where people can go and buy your suggestions. But with that program that you only get commission off of the product you recommend. Mm. With the Amazon Associates, which is designed for websites, the content has to be in a helpful article. So it can't just be a list of things you recommend. So I wrote the article on the best clarinet mouthpieces and I picked five or six to put in there. And I wrote a little blurb about each one's, the pros, the cons. So it is more so an informative article and that's what Amazon wants. Now you do have to make three sales within your first six months of being an affiliate. And you can't get your mom to go buy something because Amazon knows. <laughs> I don't know how they know, but they know. <laughs> they know who's related to you. They know, they just know. Um, they probably know because you've sent them a package in the past from your account and you know what I mean? Or something like that. All I that have stuff. have a tie in with that. Meta too. I'm not um, sure, but they know. But if you don't make your first three sales in six months, it's not a big deal. You, you don't get accepted to the program and you simply reapply and it starts over. Mm. You can make three sales in six months because I did not qualify the first time I applied. I had no idea what I was doing. Mm. But the second time I applied, I did qualify. And now I get an affiliate check from Amazon every single month. That's awesome. And then, so can you send these links in emails or do you have to send a link to the blog post from your email? They, you would have to send a link to the blog post because the links to meet their terms of service, you have, the links have to be able to be tracked. Mm. So if you send it in an email, you can get kicked out of the program. Interesting. Because I know for me and like other musicians, our bread and butter is our email list. And we want to be able to recommend things to our constituents on our email list. But maybe what we'd have to do is then create the blog post and then just send them from the email to the blog post. Yeah. I mean, that would work. What you could easily do is create the blog post. Um, so uh, you have a guitar in the background there. So let's say that you wrote, you're recommending Christmas music for guitar for children. I don't know. Just make that up. Right. So you want to recommend that. Well, write an article on it. Put those Amazon affiliate links in it. And in your email to your newsletter, it would be like, you know, Christmas time is coming up. And if you want your child to have stuff to do over the holidays when they're bored, um, there are a number of great Christmas tunes for guitar out there. And then just kind of keep going on about it and then highlight that Christmas tunes for guitar and link it to your blog post. And then that will take them directly there in a very natural way. That's not, hey, go buy this. Is there anything against you putting in your email? Click here to learn more about it. Nope. Okay. You, like you, just, very you just can't, <laughs> you can't link directly to Amazon from your email, but you can, there's nothing wrong with, you can link to your blog post anywhere you want. Social media, email, doesn't matter. Got it. And what are some other ideas uh, that musicians could, things they could promote as an affiliate? There, okay. So my music staff, I believe has an affiliate. Mm -hmm. If you use that for your studio, mm -hmm. um, I know that music and arts, it's a really big chain music store around here. They have an affiliate. All you have to do, really anything you use in your life, just Google search that with an affiliate. And a lot of times they already have one existing that you can apply for. Um, I literally just became a Notion affiliate yesterday oh. because I was writing an article on using Notion. And I was like, hmm, I should make money off of this. And, the, you know, there's an application process. You know, they had to confirm that, you know, I had a blog with a fair amount of traffic and that I had a social media with a fair amount of followers. And that is really dependent upon the company you're working with. What if you have other interests? So for me, for example, like I've recently been very interested in low carb eating and I am an affiliate for a few different low carb products that I love. Is there any way to work that in as a musician, you know, as you're talking about lifestyle, maybe? 
you could, you have to be careful when it comes to SEO with stuff like that, because if you start talking about like all of these different things on your website, Google's going to get very confused. Mm. But if you drop a blog post here and there, or if you, that would be a great one to use with social media. You know, if you wanted to do a day in the life on Instagram and your stories and you could talk about your favorite bar and whatever and just put a link with your affiliate link in there, um, you could do stuff like that or a vlog on YouTube would be a great place to incorporate that as well. I assume you could also just start another niche website like you did with your coffee 100% you sometimes you link to that like, you know, oh, hey, you know, I, I reviewed this like, you know, bar over here on my other website that I absolutely loved and I'm eating it today, you know? Oh yeah. You could, if you wanted to put that time in, because that's my gardening uh, niche website is solely because I love to garden. I live on a quarter acre and Mm. on my quarter acre, I have very little yard. It is all gardens, flower (laughs) gardens, vegetable gardens, native gardens, fruit, fruit vines. Yeah. And that could be, I mean, I don't know what your focus is on your site, but like, that's a whole thing, right? I only have a quarter acre to work with and this is what I did with it. My, my site is the suburban garden. Got it. Exactly. So, yeah. I already it is, see that all about backyard gardening. That's so cool. I love it. So, so you also encourage musicians to maybe explore other interests that they have to create a niche website. Absolutely. I think there is this this common belief in the music field that you have to be very academic and you have to be into music all the time. And that's just not true. And honestly, having outside interests makes us more interesting people in general. Um, The people who follow me on Instagram, the best traffic I get on Instagram is just from damn the life post. When Mm -hmm. I'm in my stories, like on like this morning, I was like, it's Friday, picking up my groceries, little boring stuff like that. But it really helps us connect with each other. And if you have interest outside of music, I've had people, um, I'm Catholic. I teach, I teach a Catholic formation class at my church. And I don't talk about it a lot, but, you know, I might have a crucifix in the picture or I had a picture where I'm holding the propers of the mass and people will reach out and be like, oh, are you Catholic? It's just something they relate to. So we relate with what's common between us. So having interest outside of music is completely normal and a good thing. Sometimes it's good to escape from the monotony that can be music. Exactly. I totally agree. And it really is kind of part of our brand, like our own personal interests and how we can connect with other people. Exactly. Um, So I think musicians might be thinking, okay, this all sounds amazing. How much time would I have to spend on this to really make a difference and build some kind of passive income over the next year? How much time am I going to have to spend per week? Okay. Well, that depends on if you have a website or not. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a website, you're going to have to spend a lot of time in the very beginning creating one. Um, But if you already have, and there's plugging my membership again, there's like a whole set of beginner course in there on how to do that if you don't have one already. But honestly, if you use AI writers in the beginning, it might take you two hours per blog post. Mm. By the end of the year, you're going to be cranking out a blog post in 45 minutes to an hour, depending on how long it is. I can crank out a thousand word blog post in 30 minutes. Um, the the longer ones, like I did one yesterday that was over 3000 words, that took me about an hour. That's huge. That's that's a pretty long blog post. What what is Google looking for? Are they is it OK with 500 word blog posts anymore? Or do you kind of need to have a minimum? You need to probably, there's, okay, Google has no saying on how long a blog post must be. But I preach something called epic content. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is when you write a blog post around a topic, you need to think about any question anybody might ask about that topic. And you need to address it in that blog post because you don't want them leaving your website to go find answers to another question they have somewhere else. Mm. You want them all to be there. So yes, it is a very long blog post. I also usually put a table of contents at the front with jump links. And all they have to do is they see the table of contents. If they want to just know one little part of it, they click, it takes them instantly there. 
Oh, that table of contents is so useful. That's awesome. Is that similar to what used to be called like a pillar post or is a pillar post more about like kind of really focusing on these, you know, few posts that are like your thing, like you want to be known as the expert in that and people come to your site for that one thing. I love that you just asked that question because I literally just wrote an email to my email list that's going out next week on that exact topic, pillar content. Okay, so pillar content, we hear that term all the time. And it's one term that has two distinct meanings. In the social media world, pillar content is what makes you you. So like pillar content for me would be, I'm a dog mom. I'm into passive income. I love to garden. In the blog world, pillar, your content pillars are the areas in which you write around. So say you're a music teacher and your website has content on how to run a music studio. It has content on how to teach beginners. It has content on um, repertoire recommendations and maybe piano games. Those are your content pillars there. And we also in the blogging world now call those silos. So Mm. your blog posts on that website are all going to fall into one of those four categories. It might be a post about the business side of running a private music studio. It in that same category, it could be how to make sure you get paid on time or how to deal with difficult parents. And then on teaching beginners, it, you know, how to keep children on the spectrum engaged in piano lessons, that sort of thing. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you're basically kind of having like groupings of content in different segments, right? And then you can like, okay, what are the spokes that maybe go around this one thing? Yes, that is exactly it. Cool. And it also coming up with that makes it easier. So you're not every time you're like, what am I going to write about? You know what I mean? You look at those things and like, okay, what, what angle am I going to take this time? Yes, that's exactly it. And that's what's so important. You, you nailed it right there. What angle am I going to take? Because there's going to be a thousand blog posts out there on how to teach piano lessons to beginners. But if you can put your own spin on it, how to work, how to work with nonverbal autistic beginners, Mm -hmm. how to teach beginners to curve their fingers, how to put your own spin on how to do it. Cool. That's, that's great. Or even, you know, maybe if we were talking about songwriting, like, you know, how to write a good Christmas song, how to, you know, how to come up with songwriting ideas, how to, um, I don't know, how do you, how to outline a song from the beginning? I don't know, just coming up with ideas of not just plain old songwriting. No, that's exactly it. And as you're saying all that, my brain's going, and then you can take all these ideas and create worksheets for each one and put it into Mm. a workbook and you have a digital download that you can now sell passively on all of those posts called the songwriter's workbook. That's awesome. And what kind of price do you usually charge for those kind of workbooks? Um, For digital downloads, it depends on how much content is in them. I mean, they could be as low as like $9 to $49. Mm. Um, It it just depends. You don't want to price things too low. You know, I I think somewhere in, first of all, when you're pricing something, make it an odd number. Mm -hmm. Odd numbers stick out to people. But um, you could also, you know, price anchor it and sell it $49. But if you buy in the next two hours, you can get it for $29, save -hmm. save $20. Yeah, Yeah, that makes sense. And so as far as passive income, what kind of income can people, let's say people do this for a year, what kind of income can people expect to start earning in these different areas of passive income? Well, it depends. So for ad revenue, it's totally based on page views. So it depends on how many people are coming to your website. Um, I'll use my garden blog, for example. I've been working on it for about seven months and on it in ad revenue, which I wouldn't have even put ads on it had it been my first website. It's too young. But since I already have an ad network, I just stuck them on there. It's like making a dollar. Mm. It's seven months old. It's just starting traffic. Uh, But I have made several Amazon sales on it. 
Mm. So it, it's, it's your first year, you're not going to make a lot. Your second year, you're going to make more. Year three, you're going to be making consistently. Mm. This is, this is the long game. This right. is the long game, but it's setting you up for big, think about it like investment. You know, you put a hundred bucks a month into your retirement account. You don't have a lot, but over years, you got a lot more. It works just like compound interest. That's true. And are you continuing to feed all of those sites? Like you have your coffee site that you've had for a long time. You said, oh, you could probably get away with doing something once a month. Is that about what you're doing to keep that one going? Okay. I'm going to be honest. Do what I say, not what I do. Uh, Um, My coffee blog has not been touched in eight months. Okay. I, however, it's going back in. I've been working on some big projects and I have I have trouble saying no. And I have a private music studio of 50 students. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and it's, it's a lot. So I, and, and my business has been growing. So I've been suffering from growing pains, but I've, I've done some outsourcing now and that's really helped. So um, the, the coffee blog is back on the schedule and I have three blog posts scheduled for the next couple of months going out. Um, the garden blog, I was doing four posts a week religiously all summer. Um, there's only been a couple a month going up lately. And then my uh, tanyalawson.com, I try to get two to three posts a month on that. Mm. Well, that's a lot. I mean, when you add all those up, that's why I was oh, saying it really is a lot. And I had to make some decisions and it's like, okay, out of these three blogs, which one's going to get ignored? And the coffee blog had the lowest potential. So I started ignoring it. And ironically, after this helpful content update, I started making more coffee sales again. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, I've got to get more content on there. Let Google know it's still alive. That's funny. But that's how, that's how, like, I've not touched it in seven months, but I've sold coffee grinders and coffee beans on Amazon. So that's how passive income works. Wow. That's very cool. Well, this has all been super helpful. Is there anything else you want to tell musicians about passive income, affiliate income, anything else that you feel is important that we didn't cover? The most important thing about it is you just have to try it. It seems daunting at first, but it really isn't what you get in there. And as with anything, if you don't try it, you're not going to make money off of it. And if if you try it and it flops, at least you know you tried. That's true. Well, how can people get to know and more information about your membership that you mentioned a couple of times if they really want to dive in? Oh, well, it's tanyalawson.com slash creative dash SEO, or they can find me on Instagram at doctor, well, it's dr. Tanya Lawson. They can message me over there. Um, any of that will get them there and I'll be happy to talk to them. I'm actually having, um, it's, it's going live on Instagram. It's already been in my stories. I'm having a here for the booze virtual Halloween hangout on, um, the Thursday before Halloween that's free that anybody can come and ask me question about websites. Costumes optional. Fun. That's very cool. Wow. I mean, you do, you're doing a lot. So I'm very impressed at all you're doing. Do you ever think, man, I wish I would have gotten one of those, uh, you know, professor jobs, or are you kind of feeling like, wow, maybe I found my niche doing this instead? Oh, I didn't mention that. I did find one of those. Oh, jobs okay. and I hated it. So I left. <laughs> That's, funny. That's I, funny. I I do. I do teach adjunct because I teach adjunct online and I really enjoy it. It's music appreciation, mm. but I, I did. I, um, I taught at a university full time for two years, the same one that I'm adjunct at now. And I, I taught clarinet, clarinet choir, all the women technique classes, music history, music theory. I did it all. And I just, it was not for me. Mm. It was all red tape you you always had to be very academic and very Mm. snobby and i it just wasn't it wasn't my thing and i honestly make a lot more money teaching private lessons than i ever made as a full-time professor okay you guys you heard it here and i've heard this from a few of my guests saying you know they they wanted to get the doctorate that was a big deal they wanted to become a professor and then they did it and it wasn't what they thought or it just wasn't, didn't fit them, you know? So there's, 
there's prestige around that, but that doesn't mean that that's right, right for you. And that doesn't mean that that's the pinnacle of your career. So, you know, keep your mind open. I love it. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And I hope that our listeners will check out your website, go connect with you on Instagram. And thank you so much for everything that you taught us today. Thank you for having me. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks for listening to the Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.